Hi, my name is Mike T. Lecluse, President of Lessman Instrument Company. I'd like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for how to get process data on your desktop, which is another way of saying how to use the Industrial Internet of Things to get sensor data onto your internet or the intranet. Our presenter today is Lessman's own Dan Wisey. Dan is going to demystify all you're hearing about uh, internet ready this and web enabled that and in Dan's own way he's going to make it simple to understand a very complex topic. By the end you should know how to get legacy sensor data onto your desktop or into databases to make it easy to find, interpret, as well as get notified by email or text when something's going wrong. Dan has been involved in all facets of process instrumentation since 1978 from sales and commissioning to service and support. He's a longtime member of ISA and has been with Lessman since 1988. Dan is the primary contributor to our Process Solutions blog and routinely travels to Lessman customers to help solve their instrumentation problems and help them get the most out of the technologies they use. In Dan's words, he's the guy who reads the manual nobody else reads. In Lessman customer words, He's the trainer to call if you want to cut to the so what of instrumentation. We will be muting the phone lines. If you have any questions, there is a question tool built into GoToWebinar. Please send me the questions and I'll get them answered. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Thank you, Mike. Well, let's get going here today and take a look at where we are today in this process sensor getting data on the desktop world. We have lots of analog sensors and switches out there. You can see the list of them for temperature, pressure, flow level, humidity, yada, yada. And there's, they all come out with these conditioned industrial outputs, which are really rugged because they've been used for 50 years now, 4 to 20 milliamps, 0 to 5 volt, Modbus, that kind of thing. So if you already have a DCS or you're working with a field bus, you'd already be looking at the data on your desktop, just like the guy in the photograph there because those systems are, are at a level where they already take in the data and display it for you so it gets on the desktop. But you're tuned in here today because you don't have a DCS or you're not on a field bus. You've got those analog instruments out there that you want to take a look at what's happening with them on your desktop. So we're at the point where PCs have been out there for 30, 35 years now. The issue, of course, is PCs do not natively handle process data. There's no set of terminals on a PC where you can screw a thermal couple into it and get any data out of it. So the stumbling blocks are the PC wants to talk USB or Ethernet. There's no universal protocol out there that can interpret the data that's on the USB or the Ethernet link. You need a software package to interpret or display the data. And then that critical thing that's always held things back is the driver that actually talks to the device out in the field out there that, that, that sits between the software package and the actual device. There's a whole bunch of things that are in the way of getting data onto the PC. So you sit at your desktop, you want to see what's happening, get an alarm when the switch, when the switch trips or take a look at what's happening uh, in a, is a trend out there. And the question is, how do you get the process data on your desktop? So let's talk for a minute about the Internet of Things. But what I'm going to tell you here is almost directly from an article called OPC UA Seen Through the Eyes of Users. It was written by a guy by the name of Randy Condor, published back in 2009. And it goes through the history of OPC and then what's happening with the newer OPC called OPC UA. The classic OPC was called OPC DA, DA for Data Acquisition. And the industrial world has really benefited from OPC DA because it revolutionized the ability to connect instruments in the field with the HMI software. In reality, it's just a specification. It's a set of rules that tells how the data is going to be communicated back and forth. And it's a client-server architecture. HMI software is the OPC client. Out in the field, you've got field devices. And an OPC server talks to those things and then the OPC server talks to the OPC client. Sounds pretty simple. The thing is, it uses a Windows component called DCOM, which restricts it solely to a Windows environment. OPC servers always run as a Windows service. Excuse me. And the uh, what we see historically is that 
the uh, usage of OPC track the spread of OPCs, or I'm sorry, the spread of Windows PCs in the industrial world. In the early 1990s, PCs started to get on the industrial floor, uh, the production floor, and OPC tracked that in order to make that connection between field instruments and the uh, PCs on the floor. So the people that used OPC DA are anybody that uses an HMI software program like RSView or Wonderware or any of the other 50 of them out there that's less than 15 years old. Those all generally use OPC. Ironically, the OPC Foundation, they estimate that 80% of OPC end users don't even know they're using it. It's invisible to them. It's just handling this data transfer back and forth. But as an example, Alan Bradley's communication program called RS Links, that's actually based on OPC. By any measure, though, OPC has been extremely successful and very widespread. And you guys ask yourself, why? Well, the, the visible reason is the systems integrators that put these things together it made their life easier because it made the devices in the field talk directly to the software. And it, it, the, the, what was still left of them was the thing called building the tag database. They had to go in and individually define each tag as it came in from the OPC server and scale it and do all that kind of stuff. But as an analogy as to what was happening back in the DOS days, if you had a, uh, an application that wanted to print something out, that application had to have a print driver specifically for that printer. So you might have one printer, but if you had four applications, you needed four different print drivers in order to talk to the same printer. In the Windows era, they said, no, we're going to abandon that model, and we're going to say Windows is going to handle the print operation. So therefore, the print printer manufacturers developed a driver for their printer that would work in Windows, and every application just talks to Windows, and Windows takes care of printing. It's the same thing with OPC. OPC handled that, that driver at stuff so that, that talks to the instruments so that it just took it out of the equation. So 20 years later, though, OPC DA is widespread as it is. It seems a little limited because nowadays we've got, you know, even 20 years of evolution of the PCs. We've got the Internet, and we primarily we've got wireless communications in the form of the cell phone that we're going, uh, you know, why can't I do this on my cell phone? Why can't I see information on my cell phone? Well, back in about 2010, the OPC Foundation announced that they were going to have the successor to OPC DA called OPC UA, and the UA stands for Unified Architecture, that totally restructured OPC, and it would do things like it would self-recognize that there were objects out there, and it would auto-populate this dreaded tag database that takes so much effort to put all the data into, and it would still remain this uh, uh, server client operation, and it would also include analytics. And of course, the analytics is a little fuzzy on what it means, but one thing means that if you get an alarm, we're going to notify you that the alarm's out there. So OPC UA is the kernel of what people call this industrial internet of things, and they abbreviate that capital I, little o, capital T, or two capital I's for industrial internet of things. So when you look in the trade journals and that kind of stuff, they're going to be talking about IoT. So now you get some idea what that is. So this OPC UA has been painted as a true panacea. All devices are going to be recognized and communicate with host software. The little diagram down there is just the typical thing that no matter what it is, it's going to somehow the data is going to get around to wherever it needs to be. And one way they're going to be able to accomplish this is it will not be Windows dependent. The classic is on the left-hand side. You can see over here, it's always a Windows box that has the server, and it's always a Windows box that has a client. And OPC UA, they drop the Windows requirement. It's operating system dependent. And the big clue here is that, or the big deal, is that OPC can now be embedded in devices directly. It doesn't have to have a Windows operating system to run. So you can embed it directly into a PLC, and it can talk directly to an HMI product through this client, OPC UA client server operation. The other thing is that OPC DA worked down here between levels two and levels three, and OPC UA promises to boost that so it gets up to the business network end here on level four. That's really going to please the people who pay for this, because in the end, they're the people that want the reports that summarize what's happening so that they can keep track of their business. And this just summarizes that, again, it abandons, OPC UA abandons Windows, makes it OS independent. There are some issues that people have brought up about security. When that happens, how do I make sure I don't get hacked 
and things go awry. And there was a statement out there that OPCUA is the Modbus of the new century. And to put that in the context, Modbus is probably the most widely used industrial communications protocol out there. And I can see that same thing happening that with OPCUA that it'll just, just, just about everywhere once it finally gets here. So the evolution of the smartphone has really pushed development of this because people want to see it on their cell phone as an app. Now, there's, I've gone through all this stuff, and you've got to realize, no matter what it is with OPC, it's not a replacement for the low-level signals that come directly from the sensor. You know, we're never going to see 4 to 20 milliamp disappear, or heart, or profi bus, or foundation field bus, because those are the instrument to the initial device out there. It's getting the, the, the information from there upwards where the OPC uh, is going to help. So if we summarize, we find out that up to now it's actually been a marketing promise. You know, trust me, it's coming, and it is coming. Our vendors tell us it's on the way, but as of today, we only have one device, which is a wireless gateway that has OPC UA. And to a large extent, it lives up to its reputation. It auto-populates the tag database and it's found automatically by an OPC client and that sort of thing. But I put this in, in perspective by saying, was it Xerox or IBM that in 1990 promised the paperless office by the year 2000? Well, here we are in 2015, and we don't have a paperless office, but we're a long way there. Our Canon copier out here, I do far more scans on it to make it into a PDF than I actually copy paper. But again, i got to start with paper. That's why I'm doing the scan, so that I can get it into a format that I can archive and file and that sort of thing. So the reality check is, is OPCUA here yet? Eh, not really. Is it coming? Yes, definitely. So until it arrives, what do you do? What do you, you know, how do you manage connectivity to a desktop? Well, we call it data on the desktop. And here's an example that we do. Now, we're not a process organization. We're a distributor. But we've got a server room, and you can see the picture of the 19-inch racks there. And those servers are actually critical for our operation. We do our email, our phones, web orders, all that internal software stuff happens on those servers. Well, servers generate a lot of heat, and they don't like high ambient temperatures. You've got to keep them cool. So we need to know if the air conditioning is ever compromised so that we can take some action and keep the servers cool. So what tells us that? Well, we went out and we hung up a thermal couple out there. You can see it hanging here. It's that wire hanging out there. Put a little recorder in there, and the recorder is web-based. Okay? It can send email and text messages. So we configure staged alarms. Every degree we get another alarm. And when it goes into alarm, it sends an email or a text message. You can actually see here, you can see this is the uh, face of an iPhone that a, uh, an alarm went out. You can see server room temperature, the alarm right here. If you actually look at the message, you can see that it's right there. And you get sort of the upside down question marks because uh, the world is still dealing with what they call extended ASCII. And not everybody interprets it the same way. But the point is you can read the server room temperature and know that it's an alarm at that point. So we have an app that's just like cell phones. It's a little icon here for desktops. Okay? And they tell us it's coming for cell phones too. But from the desktop, we can actually see the temperature trend. You can see it trending along here just like on a regular recorder. Or we can go into it and can see how long the temperature excursion lasted. You can see here that from this cursor point to that cursor point, this was a real quickie, and it should have been. It was just a test. But it only lasted 58 seconds. And we can see the range over which the temperatures made an excursion. They ranged from 71 to 84 degrees. And if we need to, we can go into it, and we can change those set points. It shows us our six alarms here and the various set points that they're at. And note that um, whenever we do this kind of stuff, that there's a login down here with a username and password to make sure, because this is a critical thing, that people don't get in there and mess with it if they don't belong there. So what's it like doing live? I'm just going to flip over here to my desktop, and there's my little remote display thing, and it's going to come up here in a sec. This is my menu right here. Here's a whole bunch of recorders. I want to pick the one in the server room and click on View, and it brings it up like that. Okay, and we see there's the trend. And if I want to get in and change something, I have to log in. So I do that with a username and a password and click the Take Control button. And that changes name to Release Control, indicating I now have control of it. And if I want to uh, check an alarm, I go up here and I check the alarm messages. And here's my alarm set of messages. And I'm going to pick one right here like this and say Jump to where it is on the screen. 
and it jumps right to where it shows me the trend where that event happened. I can see that, oh yeah, that's my, it's uh, five minutes to three on the 9th of October, we have that alarm there. And again, if I wanted to find out how long that happened, I'd go into it and say, give me dual cursors, and I'd give myself a second cursor over here, and it'd tell me that's 52 seconds between the cursors. So that's the kind of action that I can do on it. Or I can exit out of this and say, oh, here's my alarms up here. Let me look at the details and configure. And now because I actually want to go into configuration where I might possibly change something, it forces me to log in as a user on here. So I go back in and now I can see here are my six alarms and if I want to edit them, I can go in and change 77 to 76 is an alarm point. Now it's 76 and 77. So anything that you would, this is the ease of using a touch screen type device like this that's web enabled. You can do it remotely. You don't have to be there uh, in order, you don't have to be right next to it in order to manage it or take a look at it. I'm going to pop into the uh, you know, PowerPoint so you can, that's what it was like doing it live. And you say, well, how usable is a system like this recorder? Well, there's two parts to getting it working. There's the configuration part and there's the networking part. You got to understand on the configuration part, the reason recorders are still so popular is that recorders are not programmed, they're configured. Programming starts with a blank slate. And you have to be a programmer. You got to know exactly what you want to do and know all the code to do it, define all the sequences, all the operations. It's a fairly high skill level to be a programmer. But a recorder is configuration based and it works from menus. And we'll see that right here. This is an example of what I call blank slate programming. This is from our uh, process automation controller, the Honeywell HC900. And when you open up the software, this is what you see. That's a blank slate right there. There's nothing on it. You have to put everything on there that you want to happen with this uh, process automation controller. And that's what it would look like if you put something on there. You put a function block on there, and you label the tags, and you configure the tags, and you do all that kind of stuff. But that's actually programming something. The other form of programming on blank slate is called structured text. That's the if, then, else kind of stuff, where you have to know what your dimensions are, and you have to know the syntax, and if you get something wrong with the syntax, like you use a colon instead of a semicolon, it's not going to compile, all that kind of jazz. When you get into the HMI PLC world, a lot of times it's structured text, but the point is it's programming compared to configuration. This is what recorders do. Recorders come up with a screen. When you press the button, the task here is to change the range on pen number one from 100 to some other number. So I go into it and I configure it and then when I click the configure button I come up and I got to select pens and then from the list of pens I tell it well I want pen one. When I open up pen one it shows me here's the scale for pen one. When I open up that it tells me there's a zero and a span. If I click on span the number entry field comes up so I can change it to 150 or 200 or whatever is reasonable for that span. So you don't have to do anything but navigate through menus to configure a recorder. So with a menu-driven configuration, a technician with a moderate skill set can install it, commission it, and most importantly, make incremental changes over time. That's a really big thing because recorders got a 10-year lifespan typically. You don't want to have to pick up the phone every time you make need some minor change on it. Call a systems integrator who as soon as that happens, he starts his clock, and because he's, he's like a lawyer, and he starts billing you from the time he picks up the phone until he hangs it up, plus whatever else he does out there. It enables you to handle changes over time in-house. Now, the other part of this was networking the recorder. And, you know, you got to use your IT guy just like you use your IT guy for all that kind of stuff. It involves installing software at an administrative level, you know, so he comes over and he types his admin password in and installs the software. Sometimes you got to set up user and group uh, names and that kind of stuff, and he can be involved with that. Typically, he assigns an IP address, and he knows the gateway IP address, so they can route between subnets, but he knows all that kind of stuff. And if you want to connect from home with a PC, you can put a VPN on there so that you can get in from home or from wherever. So you involve your IT guy in this, and everybody's happy at that point. So when you look at what this actually looks like for stuff, we got recorders and there's a variety of sizes and options, so you only buy what you need. We got big screen ones here, you can see the big screens, little screen ones. You buy them with as many inputs as you need. You buy the options that you need, whether it's batch or modbus master, or whatever. It's like getting anything else. 
But again, if we just over, give an overview of this, why a recorder? Well, the charts are super readable. I mean, they've really done a good job on these paperless recorders of making the, 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 the data readable. It's a high contrast LCD. An important thing that people don't think about is the time divisions around even numbers like uh, two minutes after three o'clock, four minutes after three o'clock, six minutes after three o'clock. So you can easily tell what time when things happen on there. You can see trend data and digital data. We've seen the alarm functions on there. If you hook up a USB printer to it, you can have a printout on the USB printer. You have, hook up a USB barcode reader to it. It'll actually put the barcode in with the data, that sort of thing, or actually show it right on the chart. And we've gone through the other stuff on the bottom down there. So people want cellular visibility. You know, they want to see this kind of thing that's on the cell phone right there. Our vendors hear that. They're doing it, and it's coming. They're working on it. But it isn't here today yet. So until that happens, you might really want to consider a network recorder. Because again, let's go back to the fact that if OPCUA's promise about universal connectivity are really true, then the recorder will connect as easily as anything else, and it won't be obsolete. Because remember, in the end, you still need something to hook the thermocouple or the transmitter up to. None of the OPC stuff eliminates what I call the front end, which is the thing that connects to the things in the field there. So you can get on the bandwagon early and put the data on your desktop. So that's the conclusion of mine. Are there any questions? I don't have any questions coming up, Dan. OK. Uh, we'll go ahead and conclude. And if any questions come up as we're concluding, we'll go ahead and answer them. Uh, Dan, thank you very much for your presentation. If anybody does have any specific application questions after they hang up, please feel free to give us a call at 800-9-LESSMAN or 800-953-7626. If you don't know your account manager, please feel free to ask for myself, Mike DeLacluse, or Dan Weising. We'll make sure that you get taken care of.